In this 20th episode in the Seven Heaven Catholic Talk series, we'll explore the seventh of nine fruits of the Holy Spirit, faithfulness. When we think of the word faithfulness, one definition usually comes to the mind of most people. Lasting loyalty and trustworthiness in relationships, especially marriage and friendship. But in order to fully understand faithfulness, we must become aware of the other two definitions of faithfulness, since they will enable us to become better Catholics. These other two definitions of faithfulness are as follows. The fact or quality of being true to one's word or commitments as to what one has pledged to do, promise, professes to believe, etc. The fact or quality of being dedicated and steadfast in performing one's duty, working for a cause, etc. So now that we understand the various aspects of faithfulness, let's move on to explore three key areas of our lives where we are called to be faithful. Faithfulness and citizenship. The first and often forgotten area of our lives where we are called to be faithful is as citizens of the world and our country. In a February 2020 document titled Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops emphasized that the Catholic approach to faithful citizenship rests on moral principles found in sacred scripture and Catholic moral and social teaching as well as in the hearts of all people of goodwill. The USCCB also highlighted the fact that participation in political life in light of fundamental moral principles is an essential duty for every Catholic and all people of goodwill. This duty of faithful citizenship was also supported by Pope Francis when he stated in September 2013 that we need to participate for the common good. Sometimes we hear a good Catholic is not interested in politics. This is not true. Good Catholics immerse themselves in politics by offering the best of them so that the leader can govern. In their call for political responsibility, the US bishops also emphasized some specific points which relate to Catholics voting and participation in political parties, which I will now share with you. Firstly, as Catholics, we bring the richness of our faith to the public square. We draw from both faith and reason as we seek to affirm the dignity of human person and the common good of all. For all Catholics, including those seeking public office, our participation in political parties or other groups to which we may belong should be influenced by our faith not the other way around. Secondly, as Catholics, we are not single issue voters. A candidate's position on a single issue is not sufficient to guarantee a voter's support. Yet, if a candidate's position on a single issue promotes an intrinsically evil act, such as legal abortion, redefining marriage in a way that denies its essential meaning or racist behavior, a voter may legitimately disqualify a candidate from receiving support. Thirdly, 
Catholic voter should use the framework of Catholic social teaching to examine candidates' positions on issues affecting human life and dignity, as well as issues of justice and peace. And they should consider candidates' integrity, philosophy, and performance. It is important for all citizens to see beyond party politics, to analyze campaign rhetoric critically, and to choose their political leaders according to principle, not party, affili not party affiliation or mere self-interest. Now remember we read earlier that Catholic voters should use the framework of Catholic social teaching to examine candidates' positions on issues. Well, you may well be asking yourself right now, what is that Catholic social teaching that we should use? There are four key principles of Catholic social teaching that I will explore with you individually in order to answer that question. The first principle of Catholic social teaching is the dignity of, human, of the human person, which basically says that human life is sacred. The dignity of the human person is the foundation of a moral vision for society. The U.S. bishops expand further on this principle by pointing out that in our society, human life is especially under direct attack from abortion, which some political actors mischaracterize as an issue of women's health. Other direct threats to the sanctity of human life include euthanasia and assisted suicide sometimes falsely labeled as death with dignity, human cloning, in vitro fertilization, and the destruction of human embryos for research. Furthermore, they make clear that in addition to rejecting all of the above, Catholic teaching about the dignity of life calls us to also oppose torture, unjust war, and the indiscriminate use of drones for violent purposes, to prevent genocide and attacks against non-combatants, to oppose racism, to oppose human trafficking, and to overcome poverty and suffering. The second principle of Catholic social teaching is subsidiarity, which basically says that the human person is not only sacred, but also social. Full human development takes place in relationship with others. The US bishops make three noteworthy points in this regard. The family, based on marriage between a man and a woman is the first and fundamental unit of society that is a sanctuary for the creation and nurturing of children. It should be defended and strengthened, not redefined, undermined, or further distorted. Respect for the family should be reflected in every policy and program. Every person and association has a right and a duty to participate actively in shaping society and to promote the well-being of all, especially the poor and vulnerable. The third principle of Catholic social teaching is the common good, which makes clear that human dignity is respected and the common good is fostered only if human rights are protected and basic responsibilities are met. The US bishops comprehensively explore this principle by examining various levels 
individual employee and employer, the national economy, and the global community. Employers contribute to the common good through the services or products they provide and by creating jobs that uphold the dignity and rights of workers. Workers also have responsibilities to provide a fair day's work for a fair day's pay, to treat employers and co-workers with respect and to carry out their work in ways that contribute to the common good. Growth in justice requires more than economic growth. While presupposing such growth, it requires decisions, programs, mechanisms, and processes specifically geared to a better distribution of income. Care for creation is a duty of our faith and a sign of our concern for all people, especially the poor, who both everyday experience and scientific research show suffer the gravest effects of all attacks on the environment. The fourth and final principle of Catholic social teaching is solidarity which basically says that we are one human family, whatever our national, racial, ethnic, economic, and ideological differences. We are our brothers and sisters keepers, wherever they may be. Three key points stand out from the US Bishop's explanation of this principle. While the common good embraces all those who are weak, vulnerable, and most in need deserve preferential concern, this preferential option for the poor and vulnerable includes all who are marginalized in our nation and beyond. Unborn children persons with disabilities, the elderly and terminally ill, victims of injustice and oppression, and immigrants. Solidarity also includes the scriptural call to welcome the stranger among us, including immigrants seeking work, by ensuring that they have opportunities for a safe home education for their children, and a decent life for their families, and by ending the practice of separating families through deportation. They cement this fourth principle by reminding us that in Matthew chapter 25 verses 31 to 46, sacred scripture gives us the story of the last judgment and reminds us that we will be judged by our response to the least among us. Faithfulness and Universal Prayer It is no coincidence that the Catholic Church refers to its members as the faithful a term which the Catholic Dictionary defines as believing Christians who are faithful twice over, first by their ascent to God's revelation and again by their living up to what they profess. Consequently, the second area of our lives that we are called to be faithful is in our prayer life. We are duty bound to go outside of our personal needs and that of our friends and family, to offer prayers to God for others, both at Mass and in private prayer. We should include intentions for the following, we should include prayers, sorry, for the following four intentions. For the needs of the church, for public authorities and the salvation of the whole world, 
for those burdened by any kind of difficulty for the local community. Faithfulness and Catholic law. The third area of our lives where we are called to be faithful is in our obedience to Catholic law, which is called the Code of Canon Law. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia, Canon Law is the body of laws and regulations made by or adopted by ecclesiastical authority for the government of the Christian organization and its members. The Code of Canon Law is fully pervaded by charity, equity, humanity, and a true Christian spirit. It attempts to correspond to the divinely given external and internal characteristics of the church. It also seeks to take recognizance of the conditions and needs of the temporary world, of the contemporary world. Obedience to canon law is not optional. As Pope John Paul II explained, in the 1983 Code of Canon Law, when he stated that the canonical laws by their very nature must be observed. The greatest care has therefore been taken to ensure that in the lengthy preparation of the code, the wording of the norms should be accurate and that they should be based on a solid juridical, canonical, and theological foundation. That code of canon law outlines several obligations and rights of all Catholics, whether lay or religious. In this episode, I will focus only on the obligations since these relate to that third definition of faithfulness being dedicated and steadfast in, perform in performing one's duty as a Catholic Christian. These key obligations of all Catholics are as follows. Maintain communion with the church. Fulfill the duties which we owe to the universal church and the particular church to which we belong lead a holy life and promote the growth of the church and its continual sanctification. Follow with Christian obedience those things which the sacred pastors, inasmuch as they represent Christ, declare as teachers of the faith or establish as rulers of the church. Manifest to the sacred pastors our opinion on matters which pertain to the good of the church and make our opinion known to the rest of the Christian faithful. No one is permitted to harm illegitimately the good reputation which a person possesses, nor to injure the right of any person to protect his or her own privacy. Assist with the needs of the church so that the church has what is necessary for divine worship, for the works of the apostolate and of charity, and for the decent support of ministers. Promote social justice and mindful of the precept of the Lord to assist the poor from their own resources. In exercising their rights, the Catholic faithful, both as individuals and gathered together in associations, must take into account the common good of the church, the rights of others, and their own duties towards others. The Code of Canon Law also outlines several obligations and rights that are specific to lay Catholics, and again, I will focus only on the obligations. These key obligations of lay Catholics, that is those of us who are not 
priests, nuns, etc. are as follows. Work so that the divine message of salvation is made known and accepted by all persons everywhere in the world. Give witness to Christ by imbuing our temporal affairs and secular functions with the spirit of the gospel. Acquire knowledge of Christian doctrine appropriate to our individual capacity and condition in order for us to be able to live according to this doctrine. Announce it ourselves, defend it if necessary, and take our part in exercising the apostolate. Lay persons who permanently or temporarily vote themselves to special service of the church need to acquire the appropriate formation required to fulfill their function properly and to carry out this function conscientiously, eagerly, and diligently. Married persons should work through marriage and the family to build up the people of God. Parents should take care of the Christian education of their children according to the doctrine handed down by the church. God is the best example of faithfulness and <laughs> he provides us with the perfect model of how we too can be faithful in our lives. In my own life, I can attest to God's faithfulness. In both the Old and the New Testament, we also have persons who confirmed that God is indeed faithful. Moses experienced 120 years of God's faithfulness. And as he was handing over leadership to the, of the Israelites to Joshua in preparation for his death, he made a point of telling the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 4. The Lord is your mighty defender, perfect and just in all his ways. Your God is faithful and true. He does what is right and fair. The outspoken prophet Isaiah, who lived during the 8th century before the birth of Christ, outlasted four kings. He pronounced judgment against the Israelites because they had turned away from God. He witnessed the manifesting of his prophecy. He witnessed the manifestation of his prophecy when the northern kingdom Israel was invaded by Assyria around 722 BC and the inhabitants were exiled. However, he also prophesied about a day when God would punish the invading nations and bring back the Israelites from exile. He begins his hymn of praise in Isaiah 25 1 by saying, Lord, you are my God. I will honor you and praise your name. You have done amazing things. You have faithfully carried out the plans you made long ago. King David succeeded King Saul as Israel's second king and ruled for 40 years. He's a colorful personality. He was a musician and a poet. He committed adultery and murder. He's considered Israel's greatest king, an inspirational leader, a mighty warrior, and a man after God's own heart. He defeated the Philistine giant Goliath and fought many battles to keep the people of Israel safe. He exuberantly proclaims God's faithfulness as he had experienced it throughout his lifetime. In Psalm 36 verse 5 and Psalm 25 verse 10 when he says, Lord, your constant love reaches the heavens. Your faithfulness extends to the skies. 
with faithfulness and love he leads all who keep his covenant and obey his commands finally remember paul who was previously called saul he was a pharisee who started out hating christians and tried to destroy the church before his conversion he participated in the stoning murder of stephen and went from house to house dragging out christians and jailing them however after his conversion as he detailed in second corinthians chapter 11 verse 23 to 28 he endured many hardships for christ imprisonment whipping stoning shipwrecks lack of food shelter and clothing as well as dangers in the wild in cities on the high seas and from floodings robbers his own people gentiles and false friends in his last recorded letter from prison around uh, AD 67, before he was martyred, he encouraged the young Timothy, who was leading the church at Ephesus, to endure hardships as a loyal soldier of Christ Jesus. Despite all that he had endured in his lifetime, he was still able to confidently tell Timothy about God in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 13 that if we are not faithful he remains faithful because he cannot be false to himself the various psalmists besides King David also proclaim God's faithfulness in the following Psalms the heavens sing of the wonderful things you do. The holy ones sing of your faithfulness, Lord. Psalm 89 verse 5. Your kingdom is founded on righteousness and justice. Love and faithfulness are shown in all you do. Psalm 89 verse 14. He will cover you with his wings. You will be safe in his care. His faithfulness will protect and defend you. Psalm 91 verse 4. The Lord is good. His love is eternal. And his faithfulness lasts forever. Psalm 100 verse 5. Your faithfulness endures through all the ages. You have set the earth in place and it remains. Psalm 119 verse 90. None of us knows how long we have remaining on earth. But whether it is one hour or 50 years, Please join me in praying this prayer, this beautiful prayer to be faithful in serving God as we close this episode. Father in heaven, ever living source of all that is good, keep me faithful in serving you. Help me to drink of Christ's truths and fill my heart with his love so that I may serve you in faith and love and reach eternal life. In the sacrament of the Eucharist, you give me the joy of sharing your life. Keep me in your presence. Let me never be separated from you and help me to do your will. Amen. Now, remember to like, subscribe, and fulfill your evangelical duty by sharing this video. I'd also like to hear from you. So leave me a comment and check out the Catholic resources in the description section underneath this video.